Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I am so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very powerful show coming right up. Our special guest today is Julie Simmon, and she's here to talk to us about her new book, When Food is Comfort, Nurture Yourself Mindfully, Rewire Your Brain, and End Emotional Eating. Julie has appeared on TV and radio shows across the country on this topic, and she founded the popular Los Angeles-based and online 12-week emotional eating recovery program that offers workshops in venues like Whole Foods and at UCLA. Julie's work is designed to offer a comprehensive, step-by-step mindfulness program that rewires the brain and ends overindulgence once and for all. So let's welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Marianne. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And my goodness, I mean, I think this is a book a lot of people are just excited to get their hands on. Yes, I mean, definitely. You know, despite all of the diet books that are out there now, we still have two-thirds of adults in the U.S. are overweight, Um more than 80 million Americans are dieters, and um, so we're still really struggling with this um, overeating and weight loss uh, challenge. You know, here in in uh, the very advanced uh, United States. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we're still kind of seeing where people are going. Gosh, you know, we we need some help with this, and it's it seems that it's tied to a bigger issue. Yes, it's definitely tied to a bigger bigger issue. And, you know, as I said, you know, most of these kind of diet and weight loss books uh, are out there, but they're offering, you know, quick advice, diet tips, um, limited guidance. Uh, their attempt is focused on external solutions uh, rather than internal problems. And clearly, you know, even though the diet gurus will tell us, you know, many different ways to eat, you know, paleo, um, mm-hmm. vegan, all the different ways to eat. Most of us have a pretty good idea of what healthy eating looks like. You know, we know we need to be eating lots of fruits and veggies and lots of wholesome, nutrient-dense foods. Most of us know that. So then the question becomes, if we know that, if we have all that information, all that information has been out there and we're always finding out more and interesting new things about taking care of our bodies, but if, all, if that in- information is out there, what is getting in the way, right? Why are we mm-hmm. still struggling with our eating? Uh, why are we still struggling with weight gain? Um, what's going on, Right. Yeah, what, what's the story behind the story? What's the story behind the story? And that's where I come in. I've been working with um, overeaters, emotional eaters, imbalance eaters for nearly 30 years. And um, what I help people understand is that one of the most common causes of overeating and weight gain is actually difficulty regulating our emotions and our moods and our thoughts and our disruptive impulses and cravings and behaviors. So we're having difficulty regulating that stuff. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have difficulty doing that, there's a good chance we're going to be turning to food and other substances and unhealthy substances and other behaviors uh, for comfort. So that's some of the underlying stuff has to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, the other issues, and so what started you on this path of kind of just you know kind of unearthing what's going on with you know emotionally eating people, you know? Well, it's interesting, you know. I I think like many girls and probably boys too, but maybe a little bit more so girls. Uh, in my teens, I started to put on a little bit of that puberty weight, and I had a lot of kind of dieters around me. I had a mother who struggled with her weight and was constantly on and off Weight Watchers. I had a a stepmother who was obese. Um, And a lot of people were struggling with their weight around me. And in my teens, I began to struggle with my weight. And I was very interested in what this struggle was about for all of us. Um, It it was very intuitive to me that, you know, animals in the wild – our early ancestors didn't have 
uh, didn't know calorie counts and carbohydrate and fat grams. They didn't count and weigh and measure all that stuff. They didn't weigh their bodies. So at a very young age, I was very interested in this and experimented with lots of diets and eating plans and um, restricting my eating and restricting led to binging. And so I was still very interested when I, when I was in college. And I started to uh, run groups uh, for women who were struggling with their weight, and I was struggling with my weight at that time. And so I was always very interested in what was going on. Um, and so during those years, you know, I was kind of stuck in a cycle of overeating my favorite comfort foods, gaining weight, and dieting. And what I, be, what I became clear on was that I was an emotional eater. That became really clear, and that was one of the first pieces of the puzzle of the overeating and weight gain puzzle that I figured out was that I was an emotional eater. And I was using food to calm and soothe myself. It helped numb the pain of unpleasant emotions, uh, self-doubts and other negative thoughts, and general stress. It altered my brain chemistry. And because it's pleasurable and exciting, it was a really good distraction, and it temporarily filled up an inner emptiness or restlessness that I regularly felt, a sort of spiritual hunger. So I entered adulthood missing many basic self-care skills, uh, like the ability to move through unpleasant emotional states, comfort and soothe myself, reframe self-defeating thoughts, regulate my nervous system, um, my parents were, of course, well-intentioned, but they were missing these skills. So my mom, with all her weight struggle, she was missing these skills. My stepmother was missing these skills. My father was missing these skills. And then to add insult to injury, I had inherited body and brain chemistry imbalances that made unhealthy comfort foods and things like caffeine, stimulants like caffeine, mm-hmm. both attractive and addictive. So it took many years of study and visits to healthcare providers and um, time in therapy uh, for me to understand and resolve all the pieces of the overeating puzzle in my own life. And throughout all that time, I, I was very passionate about this subject, and I knew that I wanted to help people, uh, you know, recover, help people really understand the the underlying issues, the underlying imbalances that cause us to turn to food and kind of get stuck in that cycle with uh, food, you know, overeating, gaining weight and dieting, that that kind of vicious cycle. Well, and that can be such a vicious cycle. In fact, myself, you know, just about everyone I know, they kind of, they're, they're at one point or another, they're kind of going through this where they're like, oh, you know what, I put on five pounds or I'm carrying, you know, excessive weight or I, I just can't seem to stop eating when I get stressed out. And so it's interesting how many people are struggling with this. It is. And what's really interesting is that most people kind of still think that it's all about finding that next diet, you know, like, Mm -hmm. oh, you know, this is the way I'll do it. Or or so many people, you know, I'm not against any of these eating plans, you know, like Weight Watchers or, you know, things because often – we want to get a sense of control, and so we maybe go on a diet because we feel like I'm, I'm just feeling out of control and I need some structure and some limits. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I always tell my clients, you know, to jumpstart some motivation, you know, to feel like you've got some control and maybe you lose a pound or two and you feel a little bit better. But that approach, and again, of course, the foods we eat, uh, and the amount of exercise we're getting, those do those are factors that are important in terms of maintaining a healthy weight and a good relationship with food. But that's not the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer isn't about the next eating plan because what happens, even I have someone that I work with now who's, uh, you know, a number of people that have been on Weight Watchers and they've lost a lot of weight, but they become more what I call controlled eaters where they're kind of always living counting points um, and counting carbohydrate grams. And and the truth is that's not real freedom. I mean, real freedom isn't where you have to count all the time and, you know, think about all of that. Real freedom is that you, when you're hungry, you eat food that supports your health. 
Um, you, you eat because you're hungry, you eat until you're satiated, and then you stop. And then when you're hungry again, you eat again. And that's how we're designed, that's how we're built. Foods that support our body will shut off our appetite. Um, cravings are there for a reason because uh, certain foods are attracted to us because we're craving vitamin C or we're needing macronutrients like protein and fat. So it's normal for us to eat when we're hungry, to make a selection from all kinds of nutrient-dense foods, and then to stop. Uh, when we interrupt that uh, or we, we try to manage that with counting and controlling, it ultimately doesn't work. And, and it doesn't address those deeper issues. So we want to get off of the overeating weight gain diet, find a new diet cycle, and we want to resolve our overeating issues once and for all and have a really healthy relationship with food and with our body. And that's that's what I'm all about, and that's um, possible. And I think we can recover from these issues with food and we can we can have a really healthy relationship with food in our bodies um we need to learn some skills <laughs> <laughs> without a doubt <laughs> i think everyone can brush up on their skill set in that area <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. but we need to what i'm saying too is you know we really need to begin to let go of thinking that it's about the next diet right mm-hmm. and then we need to kind of move in the direction of questioning, you know, what skills am I missing? What what keeps me always going back to food, you know, to fill myself up on food? What can, and, and there can be lots of reasons. Yeah, it can be just more than what people are typically thinking. So what are some of the major reasons that you are seeing, you know, with the work that you do, that people get in this kind of, you know, get kind of stuck with overeating? Well, it's interesting. There are really two main causes of overeating and weight gain. Mm -hmm. Um, The first is eating because of emotional hunger and kind of an exaggerated craving for food uh, in the absence of true physiological hunger cues. And emotional hunger can actually feel a lot like physical hunger. So the first main uh, the main thing that drives overeating and weight gain is emotional eating, okay? And mm-hmm. what's really exciting to me about emotional eating, and this is why I wrote this new book, and my first book, The Emotional Eaters Repair Manual, is all about uh, these underlying imbalances. And the second book, the reason I wrote the second book, is that <clears throat> recent advances in brain science have uncovered the crucial role that are early social and emotional environment plays in the development of eating, imbalanced eating patterns. Now, I've known this as a therapist for nearly 30 years. I've seen it nearly 100% of the time in my practice that people that come to see me uh, have not had the kind of consistent and sufficient emotional nurturance during the early years when the brain is forming, uh, when the brain and nervous system are forming. They have not had that. It's not... My work is never about bashing parents because I think parenting is one of the hardest jobs on the planet. But even well-intentioned parents can miss the mark in terms of nurturing, consistent and sufficient emotional nurturance during the early years when the brain is forming. So what happens is that our nervous system can become wired for high arousal because we didn't get quite, we didn't quite get the kind of attunement and nurturance um, very early in our lives. And we can start doing things like things like I did, like I was sucking my thumb at a very early age for comfort. I was carrying around a little doll with me that had to go everywhere with me. So I was already exhibiting those signs of n- not getting the comfort I needed and trying to self-soothe, right? <clears throat> and then we begin to turn to food because as, as all of us know, food is so incredibly soothing and comforting. I was working with someone last night who was saying, you know, I'm binging again like crazy, and she said, um, she said, you know, I come home and I'm so stressed out and I so wired up and I just, it just works. You know, the food just, she 
He said, it's so pleasurable, and I don't have a lot of pleasure in my life, and it just quiets the storm in my brain. Um, And we all know that food and other addictive substances can do that. So the... What's so exciting and why I wrote this book is that these recent advances in in brain science have uncovered all this, and now we know that a mindfulness practice that includes what we call internal attunement, so we get external attunement from our parents, you know, when they tune in to our emotions and our needs and our thoughts, and we can practice something. The good news is even if we didn't get quite enough of that when we were young, we can practice a form of internal attunement so that we're going in there and we're paying attention to everything that's going on. And we learn, in this book I teach readers, how to access a supportive inner voice that can comfort and soothe and help us meet the needs that are feeling unmet. Hmm. Well, and that's such a big deal because, I mean, when you look at the, like, the root cause, I'm sure, you know, you're finding, like, some similarities where they're, maybe they, you know, you talk about this where they're not feeling supported and maybe feeling, um, you know, not heard. You know, there's lots of different things, not worthy enough, and so that all kind of plays into that. It does, and what I see across the board is that people are missing skills, Okay, so I've seen this across the board that people are missing skills. What kind of skills? Difficulty regulating emotion, okay? So whereas one client of mine might um, be grabbing food at work because she's stressed out and hyped up, so she's grabbing food to calm down some of that hyped up feeling. Another person is kind of bored and unstimulated at work. And so she's eating because of low arousal states. She can't, she doesn't know how to regulate these low arousal, boredom, apathetic, unmotivated kind of states. So she's eating to fill up that. Another person is coming home and heading to the, <clears throat> heading to the drive-thru on the way home because he is feeling down. He feels kind of sad and frustrated about his life, doesn't have a partner, isn't happy with his job. So he's frustrated and sad and down. So all of these people, you know, we could kind of take little vignettes, you know, across the <laughs> across the um, city, right, of people having stuff that's going on, emotions, right, unpleasant emotional states, that they don't know what to do with. So this is one of the major problems. How do I regulate unpleasant emotional states? That's a missing skill. Okay? Next missing skill. They never taught that in school, you know? (laughs) They don't teach that in school. And if you're, and this is where that that early um, sufficient and consistent nurturance comes in. Mm -hmm. If your mommy or your caregiver, whoever that is, is able to help you in the beginning, we need our mommy or caregiver to regulate those states for us. We, an, an infant doesn't know how to regulate tension, emotional tension, physical tension. So mommy swoops in, mommy kind of tunes in, she sees the baby is in distress, she swoops in, and she begins to comfort. Comfort and soothe, comfort and soothe, and the baby calms down. The baby begins to associate mommy with comfort and soothing, right? Mm-hmm. As the baby grows the baby begins to learn how to do some of that for herself, she starts to co-regulate with mommy. She starts to begin to learn how to to hold those kind of soothing thoughts for herself. And as she grows, she's building a voice inside that it's her mommy's voice or her daddy's voice or grandma's voice, building a soothing, comforting, regulating voice. But so what happens if we have a mommy who's anxious and can't regulate us or who's very distracted and, you know, looking at her phone and doing 10 million things while we're in distress. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, again, not to blame parents today. That's the other thing is that it's very challenging for parents today. You know, 100 years ago or or more, children were raised in villages. You know, there were lots of adults around. A, A mom wasn't totally on her own, you know, with two toddlers all day trying to get errands done. It's very challenging for parents today 
single moms, uh, single fathers, you know, parents that don't have a lot of outside support when they're raising children, much more difficult for us to nurture our children properly and get those brains uh, wired properly. So if that was happening, the baby would learn to co-regulate. You'd have a little toddler beginning to regulate him or herself more. Um, And then those skills develop. Another skill is learning to reframe, kind of catch and reframe self-defeating thoughts. If we have a mommy that's hearing us say self-defeating thoughts, and she helps us reframe that into something more positive. You know, no, those, no, the girls at school don't like me. Nobody likes me. No one will ever like me. You know, we need mommy to, or daddy or someone to help us reframe that into something more hopeful and optimistic. So these are all skills, you know, being able to regulate emotions, being able to catch and reframe self-defeating thoughts, uh, learning how to grieve losses and disappointments. We need someone to teach us how to grieve losses. You know, when Fluffy dies or Grandma dies, we don't want that all covered up and just we move on. We need to know how do we grieve. It's okay to feel those feelings and to move through those feelings. So these are all skills identifying our needs, getting clear on what we need. Um, knowing how to set limits and limits with ourselves and boundaries with others. These are all very, very important self-care skills. And I talk about these skills uh, in my first book also. Um, And then in this book, I really help people learn. I, I take off on what I started teaching in my first book is developing that inner nurturing voice. In this book, I really help people understand why they need to develop that voice. They're going to rewire their brain with that voice um, and learn how to develop that voice and the skill set that goes with it. Gosh, that's so important, you know, because there's, I mean, you're so right. I mean, we use all these factors come into play when we look at some of the reasons why we overeat as emotional eaters but it's so nice to know that there are things that we can do to turn that around. And I know in your book you talk about mastering the skill of self-regulation. What, what does that all mean, and how can we implement that in our lives? Well, self-regulation, again, you know, when we talk about um, the person who's driving home you know, from work and is flooded with all these feelings, I feel overwhelmed, I feel frustrated, I feel empty, um, I feel sad. I'm kind of even numb from all these feelings that I'm having, and I just don't know what to do with them. This is, this is a, a huge problem in our culture. You know, People are having emotions, and they don't know how to handle them. They don't know how to regulate them. So self-regulation really means, it refers to our ability to regulate uh, those emotions that we're having, those moods that we're having, to regulate our nervous system, to control or redirect our disruptive impulses and behaviors, and think before we act. So a good example I like to use, I have, have this example in my first book, is um, when I was younger, I would, let's say, go shopping, you know, go to the mall and go shopping, and I would go in a dressing room, okay, and I would just be very frustrated and upset with, the clothes weren't fitting. I didn't like the way my body was looking. Maybe I had gained a little weight. So I would come out of the dressing room just flooded with uh, emotions that were unpleasant. I hate myself. I hate my body. I'm never going to lose weight. Nothing ever fits. I hate these department stores, you know, whatever store I was in. You know, they don't make clothes that fit me. And just flooded with all this misery. And no skills. I had no skills to comfort myself other than to go get food. So what would I do? I'd head into the food court and I'd pick some food up and head home, right? Just miserable. Mm -hmm. What I needed to learn to do was to find some way to regulate these emotions, right? So not only was I flooded with unpleasant emotions, I'm sad, I'm frustrated, I'm overwhelmed, I'm depressed, um, 
but I was also having self-defeating thoughts. I hate my body. I hate myself. I'll never lose this weight. Um, I'll never find anyone at this weight. You know, all of this, emotions, thoughts, I was totally unaware of my needs. What I really needed was soothing. I needed comfort. I needed reassurance that I could get where I wanted to get to. I needed um, some self-love, right? But that was nowhere to be found. I didn't have any capacity for giving myself that, for those needs, right? So all I was left with, I was like a baby, you know, left in a crib crying. Like I have nothing, no way to comfort myself, so put the thumb in the mouth, right? Mm -hmm. What's the thumb in the mouth for most of us? Go get a cheesy noodle dish, right? But what we all know is that that doesn't build skill. It does not build any skill. So we have to stop. We have to pull away from the urge to turn to food to solve all the, that storm that's going on in the brain. We have to pull away from the food. We have to sit down, and we have to begin to practice some skills. And the very first skill in in this book is about popping the hood, you know, pop the hood and find out what is going on. Get really clear on what emotions you're experiencing and what's happening to your body. How is your nervous system getting dysregulated? So maybe you notice, you know, I'm feeling sad, frustrated, overwhelmed, and depressed, okay? Well, what do you feel in your body? Well, I feel a lot of tension in my muscles. I feel kind of a racing feeling going on in my chest. My head is starting to hurt. Um, And I'm noticing I'm clenching my fists, okay? Mm -hmm. Just the act of tuning in, popping the hood and tuning in to yourself, research shows is already calming, right? So we're already beginning the self-soothing process just by tuning in. It's, it's called attunement, right? It's what we missed when we were little. We didn't get enough of this. So now I'm internally attuning. Okay, something's going on because I'm leaving this dressing room and all I can think about is Cinnabons, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so something is going on. Let me go pull away, not walk to the food court. Maybe let me go sit in my car. I give myself permission if I need to. I'll go get those Cinnabons later. They're not closing yet. Mm-hmm. Um, pop the hood. What is going on? Begin the process of regulating your emotions. For all overeaters, if you don't learn this first skill, you're just not going to recover. You might you might become a controlled eater the rest of your life. You know, you might go on diets the rest of your life, but you're not going to resolve the underlying issues that are leading you to always go back to food for comfort. And that's just miserable, you know, when someone has to keep going through that dieting process. You know, that, that's just a miserable way of, of existing. It is, and it's, it's a terrible relationship with yourself because <clears throat> you're back to, you know, your relationship with, mm-hmm. you, with yourself is based on a lack of trust right? Mm -hmm. Like, I can't trust myself. Basically, I remember when I was in my emotional eating days, I could not trust myself with many different foods in the house. If I brought bread in the house, I would overeat the bread. If I had chocolate in the house, I would overeat the chocolate. For many years uh, during my emotional eating recovery days, I couldn't have any kind of nut butters in the house, peanut butter, almond butter, because I would be good for a day or two. And then all of a sudden, I'd start to throw raisins in it and chocolate dip chocolate chips in it and I'd be bitching on it. (laughs) Yeah. So my relationship with myself and food was one where there was a lack of trust. I couldn't trust myself to bring something in the house that was, you know, delectable to me, even a loaf of um, sourdough bread. I could not trust myself with those foods. And so that, you know, what was healthy relationship is based on, or I'll I'll reframe that, all healthy relationships are based on trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have trust with yourself, you're already having an unhealthy relationship with yourself. 
So that doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. It's kind of like it doesn't even have to be about food, but it can be, again, someone I was working with yesterday who was saying, I cannot get myself to do the things I need to do. I can't get myself to declutter my place. I can't get myself to work on my resume. You know, basically, I can't activate myself to or drive myself to do the things I want to do. Again, this is a, a, a problem in your relationship with yourself that doesn't feel good when you can't trust yourself, when you say, I'm getting up at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or whatever, and I'm going mm-hmm. to declutter that room, and then I'm going to start working on the resume, and for months, every time you say you're going to do it, you don't do it. You don't feel good about yourself when you can't trust yourself. Yeah. So something deeper is going on in the relationship you have with yourself, and this is why you, you keep going back to those foods that uh, don't work for you. Um, and, and you it's kind of a cycle. Want, huh? It's kind of like this cycle that people get stuck in. It is like a cycle, and we can even add one more piece to that, which is earlier on I, I said, you know, there are a couple main pieces of what drives overeating and um, imbalanced eating and weight gain. And I said one of those was um, an inability to self-regulate or to manage emotions and moods and behaviors. The other thing that drives overeating and weight gain is body imbalance, right? So Mm -hmm. what that means is we might have um, brain chemistry imbalances. I talk about that in the new book, and that can come from this lack of nurturance when we're young. So we have... We might have low moods, uh, we might have depression, we might struggle with anxiety. A lot of people turn to food to regulate those moods, and some of that is biochemical. Um, Overeating is also driven by things like um, hormonal imbalances, imbalances in sex hormones, imbalances in insulin, um, and then also things like food allergies and food addiction. And so many people I work with will come in and they'll tell me, I know I'm, I have a food addiction with bread, with, with flour. Uh, I know I have addiction with sugar, um, alcohol, diet sodas, whatever. But they cannot stay kind of sober, if you will, off of those substances. And I say to them, it's not just because, I know you think it's because you lack willpower, um, mm-hmm. but it has a lot to do with, your self-care, you know, your ability to nurture yourself and then to set limits on these particular substances. Like I have, I have allergies, flour, for example, and, you know, if I eat it, I immediately feel an addiction, you know, very strong cravings come up. But because I have such good self-care, I can walk in the market and I can look at a loaf of bread and I can say, oh, I, you know, I can just imagine the bliss that will go on in my brain if I start eating the wheat. And then I'm, it's very easy for me to access a limit-setting, nurturing voice that says, I get it, sweetie, you're tired, it's been a long day, that bread looks like it would really elevate all those chemicals, and it would, right? But mm-hmm. that's not good for our body, That's not good for our body. We have an allergy to that, and that makes our head stuffy, and that makes our tummy not feel good. So let's find a different, something different. Maybe we're craving, you know, carbohydrate or starch. Let's let's go bake a nice fluffy potato, or let's go have a dish of brown rice. That will work without imbalancing our body. So because I have that loving voice, I'm able to notice those kind of cravings, if you will, or impulses for uh, addictive foods, and I'm able to set limits on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I know in your book you do talk about developing that supportive voice. How long did it take for you to do that, and how does that work in just changing how we're moving forward? It's so funny that you asked that. Someone yesterday uh, who I've been working with for a very long time and, and she kind of tends to resist building that voice. 
we were talking about that again yesterday, and <clears throat> excuse me, she said, well, how long is it going to take me to build this voice? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, really, that's not a good question to ask because, <laughs> first of all, I can't answer that. I mean, it, it really depends on where you're at, how hard you're going to work on it. You know, it's like asking someone how long will it take me to be a good guitar player. I mean, how often are you going to practice? Are you going to practice four times a day? You're going to practice once a month. Um, so it's hard to, difficult to answer that. But what I can tell you is that in the beginning, when you're starting to access an inner nurturing voice, it's going to feel awkward. If you, if you haven't had a lot of exposure to a voice like that, you ha- or you haven't had access to anything like that inside yourself, it's going to be a, feel a little awkward and a little phony at first. And, you know, very similar to when you're first learning to play a guitar and it feels really awkward or you're riding a bicycle. Um, <clears throat> the key is going to be to stick with it and to, you know, listen to the wisdom of people that have walked ahead of you in these shoes like myself and stick with it and keep doing I, I take people in all my books I give a lot of skills and a lot of examples and you know I walk you right through everything I also have a 12 week program people can work with me I walk them through everything you keep practicing you keep practicing you keep practicing and so in my own journey I kept practicing this voice because I knew I just had an instinct that it was important this voice. Mm-hmm. So I kept working on it. And over time, I cannot tell you how long it was. There just was a point in my journey, and this was a real turning point for me. I was laying in bed one day, and I heard a voice inside my head that said, I love you, Julie. I love you. And I was like, where did that come from? Like, whose voice is that? You know, what was happening was that because I had been practicing this, Self-love was beginning to develop. I was beginning to really care about myself in a, in, a, in a loving, kind, nurturing way rather than the kind of harsh, critical. I came from a fairly um, shaming, judgmental, critical mother. So that voice was beginning to reside. Um, reside. I think the word, that wasn't the word that I wanted, but... As that voice quieted down, and, I, and this is one of the skills we work on in the book, is learning how to kind of silence. That's the voice I wanted, the word I wanted. As we learn to silence and quiet the voice of the inner critic, right? Most emotional eaters have a very, very loud, strong, inner critical voice, constantly telling them they're not good enough. And that inner nurturing voice is so is tiny and very undeveloped. So as you begin to silence that other voice and build the inner nurturing voice, and I always have a saying that I say, you know, never let that inner critic have the last word. So when you're busy beating yourself up, I did terrible on that, I'm a piece of crap, I'll never, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. never let the inner critic have the last word. You must bring in an inner nurturing voice that says, hold on, hold on. I don't like this beating that's going on here. Yeah, I'm here too. I'm here to say you are wonderful, you are beautiful, you are incredible. And by the way, did I tell you how much I love you today, right? Always bringing that voice in. Now, in the beginning, if you haven't had a lot of this, if you didn't hear a lot of this when you were young, it's going to feel fake. It's going to feel artificial. But you must keep with it. That's why I ask people to write it. You know, practice writing it because over time – you might say, this doesn't feel natural to me, but it mm-hmm. sure feels like something I'd like to have feel natural. So let me keep working on it. It must make such huge shifts in the person themselves, but I know in your book you talk about how it really kind of rewires our brain. It does rewire the brain. That's, I'll tell you something, that is what is so exciting, and that's what led me to write this book is that I was practicing these skills. I was picking up these skills from different places, therapy, people I noticed who seemed much happier and um, Mm -hmm. healthier emotionally than I was. I was picking up these skills all over. 
and practicing them and piecing them together because any therapist I went to didn't have this all laid out for me. Nobody had it laid out for me. So I was kind of finding all the pieces of the puzzle and the emotional derailment, if you will, puzzle Mm -hmm. as I went along. And I didn't know the neuroscience back then. I didn't know what had happened to my brain. I only knew that I wasn't the same person anymore. I was once someone who really beat up on myself hard. I mean, I'm a pretty driven person, but I was pretty perfectionistic and very, very hard on myself. That voice isn't there anymore. It just isn't. And people might think I'm making it up or it's not really true, but it is really true. I don't have a a harsh, critical voice in my head anymore. We all need an inner critic that says, you know, I kind of blew it. I didn't prepare for that exam and I need to Mm -hmm. study a little bit more. We need to have someone that can can give us constructive criticism but none of us need a destructive inner critic in our head and um, so over time as I practiced these skills something was happening to my brain that I didn't know about until I started to read years later the neuroscience about it and I began to understand that what happens when we're young and we don't get that sufficient consistent nurturance that we need is that there are connections that are supposed to form between the emotional brain, which is kind of the lower brain, the middle, middle part of the brain, the emotional brain. That's the part of the brain that is like your alarm system. It uh, tells you, you know, to back off from the snake, you know, or run from the person that's trying to grab you. That's the emotional brain. When we don't get enough consistent, sufficient nurturance when we're young, that part of the brain doesn't develop these kind of connections, uh, neuronal firing patterns, if you will, between the top, the upstairs part of the brain, which is the cognitive, the cortex, which is the part of the brain that regulates. That's the part of the brain that soothes and comforts and regulates our emotions, our moods, our impulses, our behaviors, our thoughts. So if we don't get that consistent, attunement coming in in our early years, those connections between the soothing part of the brain and the emotional brain don't connect. And so what does that ultimately mean? It means that when you're very, very upset about something, you cannot access a soothing function in your brain. So this is what we see with overeaters. They cannot access, there's no access to a soothing function. Those neuronal firing patterns have not developed. So when you think about it, if you don't have those firing patterns going on in your brain, you are basically left to figure out some way, like a baby. Suck your thumb, grab a dolly, um, you know, you're left to find something to regulate the alarm that's going off in your brain, the bad day that you just had, the fight with your husband, whatever. Um so that would be kind of hopeless. Like if, if, if that could never be wired in, what didn't get wired in when we were young, it would really be hopeless. It would be like, okay, we're just stuck turning to substances the rest of our days. But the good news is, is that we can, we can create those firing patterns. The brain, we now know the brain has something called neuroplasticity, which means the brain is malleable and moldable and plastic. And we can, through our experiences, like practicing the skills that I teach, we can now wire in those connections. We can develop the soothing, comforting function of the brain. That's by practicing that voice. And by doing that, when we're in an emotional state, that's our emotional brain, we're going to wire in this soothing pattern and these connections. So down the road, Initially, you have to practice and practice and practice, just like playing that guitar. Initially, you have to place your fingers on each fret and on each string and then pluck, right? Initially, it's very awkward. Yeah. But over time, when you keep at it, same with the brain, you will be very upset about something going on in your life, and all of a sudden, whoosh, in comes an inner nourishing voice that says, hey, 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 sweetheart. I know, I know you're really upset right now. I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you. 
you know, and begins to soothe you, right? Maybe you just took an exam and, and you got your results and you didn't pass and you're in a tizzy, right? All of a sudden, the inner nurturer swoops in and goes, okay, okay. I know, of course you're upset. Of course you're upset. It's okay to be upset. I really understand being upset. I'm right here with you. I'm right here with you. You begin the soothing, okay? None of us can think straight when we're upset. We need to calm down first. We need to know how to calm ourselves. So this is the wonderful, fantastic thing about the the brain science we now know is that we can rewire the brain. And as we learn and practice these skills, we rewire our brain. And then it doesn't take all this work down the road. It takes some applied energy and time now, but down the road, you're going to be a great guitar player. Yeah, it ends up being just second nature. Yes, very. for me it's second nature to calm and soothe myself. Um, you know, because I always say this to my clients, you know, when they're talking about being overwhelmed, I say, you know, every successful person that you see that you maybe even aspire to be gets overwhelmed on a regular basis, right? I say, I get overwhelmed regularly. I clear out my desk, everything seems to be, in order, and then 17 other things pile on, and then I feel overwhelmed, right? And then I work through that with a very nourishing, nurturing voice. It says, okay, let's figure out what's what's a fire that needs to be put out. Let's figure out, you know, what can wait. Okay, we'll do that two months from now. In comes that voice that calms me and soothes me very quickly and very naturally. And I always say to people, if I could learn to do this, Mm -hmm. anybody could, because I did not have anything like this going on in my brain when I was younger. I was really missing it, and I was overeating, and I was binge eating, compulsive binge eating. So if if I could do it, you could do it. Mm. Well, it gives great, you know, just inspiration to people that, regardless where you are in your journey with food and just being the emotional leader, that there's hope. You know, it's not like this is the end game because it seems like a lot of times when we've talked about this, how it's just people can kind of yo-yo back and forth on diets and not really getting to what the root cause is, which you really have established here. Yes, and and established um, the path, you know, to mm-hmm. resolving it. I mean, when people come and work with me, they whether they come work with me privately or they take my 12-week program, they always say, you know, this is right on. I mean, they just do because they it's intuitive. You know that you're missing these skills and that, you know, once you know, you can kind of never go back to unknowing, you know, that yeah. you're missing skills and you need to gain these skills. And that's the, yeah. the wonderful news that I always like to tell people is that it's not – that there's something desperately wrong with you, you know, you're just missing some skills that are really learnable. And uh, you can replace them with healthy habits. Exactly. Healthy habits and um, learn to have self-love through the process. Mm -hmm. You know, you learn to love yourself and uh, really care for yourself in a way you probably never have before. Yeah, it leaves it. people with the opportunity to kind of look at things in a different light. Well, and so what would be some, like if you can offer just one piece of encouragement or advice to someone who's an emotional eater, you know, what would you like to leave them with? You know, I would want to tell anybody who's struggling with emotional eating would be to not lose hope um, that there's true recovery out there, to not not think that this is about another diet that you have to find or that you'll never, ever, you know, have that body that you feel good in um, or have a good relationship with food. I would just say never to lose hope. Practice the skills, you know, that I teach in this book and that I teach in my first book. Um, Keep at it. Rather than keeping going back to find a new diet all the time, go back to the skill building. And you fall off, and you will. I mean, we all fall off of our skill building 
yeah, pick the guitar doesn't. back up. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> start punking around. Mm-hmm. Sit down to the piano. Start punking around on the keys again. Go back uh, to your skill building, and you'll find that you you already built a little bit of skill. Keep at it. Um, you get to kind of a turning point with anything, you know, like using our guitar analogy, but with anything, you get to kind of a turning point where it starts to feel much more natural. You and I were talking earlier about skiing. I remember when I was first learning to ski and snow plowing, I was like, God, how do you ever get the hips and the feet and everything, like, going? And then just one day from continuing, your body starts to do it. Um, same thing with building that inner nurturing voice, at some point it clicks. And I can't tell you if that's three months, six months, or two years. I do ask people, especially when they work with me, I ask them to take the focus off of some quick weight loss. You know, take take the focus off of losing weight and put the focus onto gaining skills. Because with this approach that I teach, the weight ultimately comes off, and it comes off much more effortlessly than it ever does with a diet. Um, So put the focus on the skill building, you know, learn the skills that are in the book, get some professional assistance if you need it, Um, but you can do it. it. It is doable. Anybody listening to this who's struggling with their food, I get it. I know where you're at. I've been where you're at. And complete recovery is possible. That's the good news. Complete recovery. That is good news. (laughs) Yeah. That's a lot of inspiration, you know, for for people. And and so if someone wants to connect with you and be part of your community, where can they go? They can go to my website, uh, Overeating Recovery, with no spaces, overeatingrecovery.com. Um, I also have, as I said earlier, I have a 12-week program um, that they can participate in, and we go through we go through all the skills, um, the self-care skills, the body balancing principles, and the soul care practices that I teach in my first book, and we also cover all of the stuff because it, it all uh, goes together of the second book in the 12-week program. So they can work with me. Um, live in Los Angeles. They can also work with me. My program is in a teleseminar coaching format, so we have lectures and um, live coaching calls with me weekly. Um, can find out all about that at my website, overeatingrecovery.com. Oh, awesome. Well, you know, Julie, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today and sharing your great book, When Food is Comfort. Thank you for having me. And by the way, if people go to my website, they can get two free chapters of the book so they can get started <laughs> right away. <laughs> you get, get, get going and not have to wait for the book to arrive. That's even better, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Julie, thanks so much. We appreciate you um, spending your time here and sharing your insights with us today. Thank you so much, Marianne, for having me. Well, that's the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guests and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.